welcome to the last session for tonight. Um, and, um, please give a warm welcome and applause to the all-purpose ninja of the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, so, um, it's a pretty small audience, so, you know, if you want to just ask questions during this, don't even, like, hesitate. I'll just kind of wing it and do it a little bit differently. So, you know, the whole purpose of our work, basically, is to make sure that everybody on the planet has access to free knowledge. I mean, I'm sure, like, all of you have used Wikipedia before, right? Okay. So, the big thing for us is that even though everybody has, seems to have access to free knowledge, it hasn't really been fair across the world. Um, there's still a lot of people that don't have access. So, I actually just arrived from India last night. I spent a lot of time there because the problems that you know we have in some developing countries doesn't really reflect like the problems that you have here and in other developed nations. So, I actually was supposed to have some really good news when I was in India. We're working on deployment down there to make sure that more people in India have access to Wikipedia and free knowledge. Uh, we didn't finish your work though, but I wanted to come here and give a talk, so uh, my team is still down there. And I think the way to think about this stuff, you know, when we went down to India, um, and we've done this in a lot of other countries in Africa and um, Asia, Malaysia, for example, Bangladesh, it's that we whitelisted Wikipedia. We did this program called Wikipedia Zero. And it's, you know, it's kind of like, from, if you're familiar with Facebook Zero, if you're in developing countries, it, what it did is it, we whitelisted URLs and people don't have to pay because that's a big barrier for people to, you know, access any type of content. Um, the issue we started to coming across, and if you go to like Africa, even if you have free data, you don't have a data enabled phone. So there's numbers where upwards of some countries, like 80% of the people cannot access content even if you whitelist it and make it you know, freely available for them. So like I said, our whole thing was about free access. So what we did is we ran a lot of experiments and you'll probably hear next week, there's gonna be a big deployment for us where people in India, the first time, are gonna be able to access Wikipedia via text, USSD and SMS, and we're gonna make, at that point, it available to 300 million people in the world for free. So. Sorry, I go into this slide right here. So I had this slide on here because this is kind of um, Tron. Who's seen original Tron here? Not new Tron, original Tron. All right, that's good because I didn't expect that many people to, to see it. So when I was growing up, um, movies were expensive. They're like three bucks, you know? So I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can go see a movie if I don't know if it's good or not, right? So. When Tron came out, I was like, hey, I want to see this movie. And I was like 10 years old, but I was like, I don't know if I have three bucks I can waste. So I was like, I got to find a review on this. And there wasn't like, you know, the internet. A lot of people weren't able to like voice their opinions about this. So there's these two guys um, that reviewed movies. I don't know if you guys know these guys in the US, Siskel and Ebert. Anybody know those guys? Okay, probably not, but two old guys, right? And so, I basically waited. I'm like, oh, I can't waste three bucks because they both gave a thumbs down to this movie. And that was the only knowledge that I had, right? And not like today where you could rip a movie, and which I don't really recommend officially, but um, you, you couldn't see anything right away. You know, so I had to wait like months. I think it came out on video like a year later. And then I saw Tron like, on my TV. I'm like, damn, this movie is awesome. I'm really pissed that I didn't see it in the movie theater. And so I remember I, I was complaining to my dad about it. My dad goes up to me and he says, that's what you get for listening to two old white guys. So this has kind of always been in the back of my mind. It's like, this is the establishment and they tell you what to think. All the barriers are kind of controlled by them. So Wikipedia kind of symbolizes where that revolution really broke. Because if everybody, like all the people here sitting here, you're the guys that have contributed to Wikipedia, you've made it. You don't have to listen to like other people telling you what type of knowledge you're supposed to listen to. So before Wikipedia, you guys all already know this, but you know it's very static, restrictive, things didn't change in time. And like I said, it was controlled, knowledge was controlled by very few people. 
now this is what it looks like. It's people like you, all the people that are out there um, working on your computers. This is where our, our, our main body of knowledge is. And it's pretty amazing. Like, even when I go talk to people about it, no one's really expected Wikipedia to keep growing the way it does. And we're over 22 million articles right now, 4 million just in English. But that growth is really rapid in um, some of the developing world now. I mean, there's probably a lot of Germans here. German, German Wikipedia already has over a million articles. So the interesting thing about this model, and I talk about how do we increase access, and what I've learned from Wikipedia is like, what can we use this model for in like solving other problems, right? And if you think about all the things that are out there right now, I mean, you have like learning. Learning kind of sucks, and it's getting really, really expensive. Um, if you're a kid, you basically have to deal with this situation where, you know, the teachers tell you what to do. You can't really collaborate with people around the world. And, you know, it's kind of a really structured way of doing things. And then you have, like, global warming, right? I have, like, friends that are trying to figure out ways to tackle this problem. And if we wait for governments and uh, other types of people in the establishment, we're kind of, like, the world you're going to pretty much grow up in is going to be underwater. No one wants that, right? But I was thinking of other things we could probably solve. And this is going to affect you guys the most. So everybody knows about the labor problems right now, the job market. It pretty much sucks all the way around the board. And this really affects all of you. And taking some aspects of like Wikipedia, you know, what can you use community for where they can use technology to, you know, create their own solutions for these problems. And if you look at the problems for labor, this is just one of the ones I was kind of brainstorming with some friends. Like in the US alone, there are 10 million jobs going to be lost in 10 years. And this is particular for Spain. How many Spanish people are here? All right, then I guess you're not in such a, as bad a situation. But I know there's 2,000 Spaniards at this conference. And 46 of them, and they're probably the people that are most likely to be at this event, are going to be out of work. And they're not going to be employed. And it's a lost generation. So. You know, we looked at the statistics for this, like, you know, some friends and I were thinking about this. And this is like, you know, knowledge starts about like collaboration. We get everybody involved. And basically, we as just, you know, common people, citizens of the internet, we control our knowledge. What can we do for other problems? And like, I was like experimenting, what can we do around labor? And if you look at this, this is the worst period ever in terms of what the hiring process is going to look like. And this is pretty much your future if you leave it to the establishment. So I had some friends, like when I was working in Japan a long time ago, um, I had a friend, Wilson Tang, and we just kind of like talked about, hey, what can we do? Is there an application that takes aspects of community and Wikipedia where people can kind of, you know, crowdsource solutions and then work together where actually you're kind of bypassing the establishment. And then Wilson had this friend, Mike, who's actually here today. Um, he was talking on a different thread and he's done a lot of different things in terms of like community involvement with media. And then I had another friend, Eric, who like co-founded TripAdvisor. How many of you have heard of TripAdvisor? Right? So there's another site where really you got community to kind of drive the way the content should be around like what you're thinking about travel and you know empowering like the choices that you want to make. So I kind of want to just bring Mike up here for a second and kind of we talked about like some of the different things we could do to tackle these problems. Uh, thanks, Cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the issue that Cool and, cool and the gang and I were, were wrestling with was just this idea of chronic unemployment. And it's a, it's a hugely daunting pro problem. And one of the things I just want to get out there is that I think that solving these problems starts with not being intimidated by the scale of them. And, uh, I've got this picture on the screen because it's, it's a really meaningful picture for me. Uh, ten years ago, I started a company called Now Public, and the goal of it was to fix the news media. I was just really disheartened with what I saw in the news business. And so we had this crazy idea, and this was before Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. We had this crazy idea that we could empower people to take photographs and post pictures and write stories from the perspective of people who were in the news business or in, in the news stories rather than being in the news business. And within three years, we actually built the world's largest citizen, citizen journalism network. We had over 250,000 people across the globe 
writing and reporting for us. And this picture is actually from Hurricane Katrina. We had 2,000 people in the area of Hurricane Katrina, which when you think about it from the perspective of the news business, is larger than the entire Associated Press's reporting staff. So my point is, is that if you think about chronic unemployment, it seems like a daunting, impossible problem to solve. But if you think about what have I solved in the past, what other complex problems have I solved in the past, and how have I done that, you can begin appreciating how you might solve this. And so one of the things we thought about is, well, we're software people, we're developers, we can build stuff. How do we do that? How do we build product, for instance? And so we, talked some, we took some of the lessons from agile development. We thought, and I know that gets abused and overused a lot, but if you just think about jobs as kind of in the same way you think about products, and you sort of reduce those down to the smallest possible components, and you think about skills, the skills that you have as a, as a contributing member of society, and you can reduce those down to the smallest possible pieces, what does that do to the notion of work? Can you rebuild work in a way that tackles this huge system systematic problem of unemployment? And if you think about all of the things that you need done, if you start thinking about it not in terms of, I want to hire someone, I want a personal assistant, I need a graphic designer, or I need someone to do some welding for me, but you just think in terms of tasks, in terms of little microscopic pieces of help that you can get, and you aggregate all of those tasks in the world, Think about the aggregate demand of all of the world's to-do lists. It turns out that the world actually has a pretty big to-do list. So if we can tap into that and we can match make between the demands and the needs that people have out there, and we can match those demands with the skills that people have, we might be able to solve those big problems because there are many of us and many of us are talented. If you think about all of the capabilities of all the 10,000 people in this room for this week, there is literally nothing we can't do. So with that in mind, we put together, um, we want to do a little experiment, and we want to see if we can get people helping each other. So if there's anything you need during your stay at campus party, if you need a new a clean pair of socks, if you need someone to design a logo for you, if you... Uh, need some help thinking through a problem, post it to the site, and if you think there's something you can contribute, go and see who needs your help, because we believe that if people can help each other, it will unlock the incredible demand that people have for help and match it up with people who can provide that help. And we'll all get the clean socks that we need. So thank you all for uh, your time, and... Um, Cool, I'll hand the microphone back to you. So this is just kind of an example. I mean, that's a pretty tall task to try to change the labor market or climate change or whatever. Um, and I know we've kind of done this for knowledge, but I also want to talk about that there are lots of examples where you can kind of change the whole mentality of the establishment and using technology and community to make the changes that you want to make. So, how many here are like big fans of SOPA? Raise your hand. That guy over there. See that guy raising his hand? All right. So, this is a you know, major problem. Um, it was really interesting because the, our whole kind of attention brought to like, you know, controlling content and, and um, this was really about um, censorship in a lot of ways, right? And it happened in Italy, and I remember talking to a bunch of Italian community members, and they emailed me, and they're like, you know, we're going to shut down Wikipedia, like, in a couple days. And we're just talking about Italian Wikipedia, obviously. And this was during, you know, when Berlusconi uh, and his government wanted to make sure that people couldn't put any bad content about him and make people responsible for that. So that pretty much, when they decided to shut down Italian Wikipedia, it sent a big message, you know, to the government that, you know, the people actually care about this. And this really affects the way that, you know, they're act activating themselves on the internet. So because of this, you know, it kind of went both ways. A lot of governments started getting scared because it was very, very effective. The bill basically in Italy got killed before it actually went to vote. So other governments started thinking about this. There was PIPA, um, you know, in other countries, SOPA in the United States. And people were kind of debating, like, what power does the community have? Because First of all, we could change our own knowledge. You know, can we control the laws that are actually affecting us? So in this case, 
you know, working, you know, using uh, the community platform, Wikipedians got really upset about this. And this, you know, and Wikipedia has been around for over a decade. Like on all the mailing lists, this was the most discussed topic ever was SOPA, like what to do about SOPA. And all the volunteers, you know, made suggestions and it was like, I believe, well over 90%. They made a decision that we needed to shut down to send a message. And so within two days, we basically had a lot of discussions and we shut down Wikipedia, you know, because that's what the community wanted. And that was to send a message that, you know, the people are actually in charge of what content is available. So maybe some of you guys remember this. Anybody go, remember going to Wikipedia during the blackout? Yeah, right on, okay. So this is what you saw. And really, I mean, it sent a really big message. I mean, what was really interesting was that we heard back from a lot of people that were emailing, going to a lot of Congress people in the United States, going to their websites. And some of them basically, you know, were, um, you know, shut down because they were just getting too much traffic. And then people were discussing it was the number one topic. I actually walked over to the Twitter building that day and you could see all the Twitter feeds basically, you know, were just going through the roof, everything about SOPA and shutting down Wikipedia. And this is the startling effect it had. So if you look at this, this image right here, you had 80 people in Congress supporting SOPA because they didn't really care. I mean, it was really hard to deal with the people at that time. They really just dealt with, you know, a lot of the special interest groups. And what's really interesting to know is up until this point, every law that was like pushed through to protect intellectual property, like content, you know, came from the establishment, um, it was passed. None of these bills have ever been rejected in history. But when SOPA came around and shutting down Wikipedia and some other, you know, other like-minded sites, um, you basically had a complete turn in public opinion that affected how Congress people had to feel about this. So from one day in 24 hours, starting this campaign, there were 30, like I said, 31 opponents of this bill. It tripled, more than tripled overnight to 101. And essentially the bill was shut down. So that kind of tells you the power of people and technology. I mean, we talked about Wikipedia, you know, there's the issue with SOPA, and then you have this, everybody knows about what's been going on, you know, with the Arab Spring, right? It's not the Twitters and the Facebooks or the Wikipedia that's really doing this, right? We talked about Ayudo, you know, it's just kind of an idea, like we're just trying to think about what are the other community-based platforms we can build that are going to tackle a lot of these problems. Like, what can we do where you actually control the labor market? Because if you look at this, you can topple the government. And like I said, it wasn't the platforms that did this, it was the people behind it. So it was the people that were sending tweets. It was the people behind that were sending messages on Facebook that were organizing. You know, since I just came back from India, and I was talking to a lot of people that, that were down there, and they were following the Arab Spring, and they were saying, yeah, that was pretty interesting, but you know, that could only probably happen in Egypt because things were really so bad there. Like, we can't see this happening in India. And this was a 32-year-old guy saying, to, saying it to me, right? I mean, he's not that old. And then there was this anti-corruption bill that was trying to be passed, you know, through the Indian, Indian um, parliament. And it was stalled. And then people in India were actually inspired by all the things that were happening, whether it was SOPA, it was, you know, the revolution that happened, you know, in Egypt. And the next day, there were millions of people in India that actually went into the streets to, like, protest the stopping of this anti-corruption bill. And they stopped all traffic throughout Delhi. Like, that's how powerful it was. So, you know, we're thinking about, like, you know, applying it to labor. If you went to, like, Ayudo, could you do something there? Maybe it's not us. Maybe you guys take it over. We don't know. But there's so many things that are available out there. And so, like, my mission has really started out as, like, galvanizing community so you can control your knowledge. You know, working on other things where the community has come back to us and say, let's stop these, like, you know, attempts by government to control information. Well, what else can we do to solve these other problems and have the control within us? So when I talk about the futures here, and it's, you know, as William Gibson says, it's unevenly distributed. When I went to India, it was an access issue. It was all about problem solving. So, you know, I got 
people in South Africa to develop middleware to basically meet me there. I had some of my team, we had ops people in Greece, and we said, we're going to stay here in India until we walk away. Well, I actually went and left a day early, but it's still happening. My team's still down there. And we're going to make Wikipedia, and eventually we're going to use the same platform from M M Health and other types of information, education, that we can deliver to people that don't have access. Now, when you think about access, we're thinking about it in a lot of different senses. So if we talk about like jobs, what's available for people that are you know 20 to 30, that's also unevenly distributed. So the people that are older that are not part of the internet generation, they have all the jobs right now, right? Like we don't have access to a lot of these things, especially the people that are you know, coming into society that are, you know, graduating from college, there's not a lot of opportunity for them. We have to really think about, like, what are the things we can do? What platforms can we create? What tools can we build that's going to allow us to have, you know, the society that we want to have? So this all comes back to Tron. And the reason I say this is that I kind of really thought about, you know, wanting to see the movie and, like, they're saying, you know, the the establishment at the time, you know, two old men, you can define it however you want. But Tron really was fighting for the users. And that's what you guys are. I mean, you're fighting for the users. It's for yourself, right? And that's what Tron is about. This is what we're all about, right? Whether it's any of these tools out there, it's Ayudo, Facebook, Wikipedia, these are all tools for us. And we need to build more tools and we need to support them and define them the way they should be. So when I go back to Wikipedia, if I'm trying to even do something, I really focus on kind of the mobile technology and delivery. Um, I don't really have any control over the content anymore. If I want to make changes to like the CSS, if I want uh, like Malaysian, like Wikipedia to look better on mobile, I actually have to ask the community members for permission at this point. And that's the way it should be. And if we create any other platform and, you know, like I you know, experiment on that, we should listen to you. And if somebody kind of knows what they're doing, maybe you're going to take that over. But I want you guys to kind of understand that there's a lot of things out there we could take advantage of, and we start. We should create our own markets around everything. We should be able to control, you know, what's going to be said about policy, about global warming, climate change, and make those actions happen ourselves. So, like I said, it starts with knowledge, but it goes to many different places, and we need to kind of figure out where are those next revolutions, and those revolutions start with you. So if you have any questions on any of these things that we talked about, things that we can do next, um, please feel free. All right, yeah, over there. I have a question to Wikipedia. Can I use the e-book reader there, a simple way, in a short time? I use then Wikipedia to to get information in an e-book reader. Yeah. So I mean, we've worked on a lot of different tools because we're all about delivering information, right? So, what what e-book reader do you have? Yeah. So I mean, there was we worked on some extensions where we made the content available in repositories. So like, there's there's open ZIM files. So the storage format is there. Um, and I think like what we do is like we basically build extensions so you could have offline versions. And you know, you could join our offline list, offline L, to see some of the discussions, but there's so many different ways to access it. So, you know, if you just kind of go on our site and we can we list out like where you can access different versions, whether you know it's mobile web, does that have a Wi-Fi connection? Yeah, but there's multiple ways to do it. So, I mean, talk to me afterward. But you, it could be offline. It could also be, um, you know, on a mobile device. Um, you know, now we're trying different ways to deliver it as well. But um, there's, I think somebody's already built, like, an EPUB extension. So if, you know, if that's the type of reader you have to support that, then, you know, you should be able to have a version for it. Yeah. Uh, if I may just comment on that, there's ebook readers like Nuke, for example, that have an ARM Cortex A8 processor in it, and you can actually flash it to Android 2.0, and there's Wikipedia apps for that, so that would be a pretty fast way to quick and dirty get Wikipedia on your ebook reader. I'm not quite sure what you have. Uh, I didn't see it. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. But I mean, there's multiple solutions for that. So the, even if, like, let's say that you're running on, um, I mean, we're actually going to have a J2ME app. We're going a little bit backwards. But, you know, like for S40 devices, there's actually a Symbian app that's available. Um, you know, you, I don't know if you're running, like you said, what you're running on, if you want to have, like, an a Android hack for it. But there's a whole bunch of solutions for it. I mean, if you email me later, I can kind of help you figure out what's the best way to do it. What way has the IUDA platform been used previously? Yeah, so we actually were doing some tests in Vancouver, and like, you know, Mike was kind of leading that, so he has some pretty interesting examples about it. Um, yeah, it was interesting because we, we started off with this very kind of vocational point of view that it was about work and, and trying to aggregate demand around these kind of smaller units of work, and so we expected it to be very much uh, limited to professional use. And we, because our, most of our office is actually in Vancouver, it's funny, we were talking today about our distributed team, and I actually met Eric for the first time today. We've been working together on this for a year. He lives in Paris, I live in Vancouver. So most of our office is actually in Vancouver, so we thought, let's try it in Vancouver. And when we built the app, we launched it. We've got about 4,000 people who are using it. So they're, you know, they're getting work, and they're, it's like design work, it's, it's kind of casual labor, it's all sorts of stuff. But the thing that surprised me is the stuff that's outside of a professional context. So, for instance, we've got people who are asking for and providing volunteer opportunities, right? There's lots of people in the world that want to just lend a hand, and there's lots of people who need a hand. And volunteer organizations have the same problems that corporations do, where they, they can't necessarily hire a full person. And volunteers have the same problem that uh, employees have, where they can't necessarily commit to a full-time thing, right? So. I can spend two hours a week saving the environment, but I can't do it you know, for, the full, for the full week. So we've had lots of that stuff. We've also had people who are in an emergency situation, like we had um, people who were impacted by a tropical storm in Florida who picked it up and started using it. So it's just, it's, it's kind of like the base unit of uh, currency is sort of help. I need help, I can give help. And so that just spans things that are way beyond uh, employment. So we're, we're anxious to see where this goes. We think it's got a lot of potential. I think the interesting thing is like, you know, I had a discussion of kind of our involvement with it is like, we're just whatever, whoever can like provide a solution for it. I mean, we kind of started the idea, but like he was better to lead it. So I was like, why don't you go? And we all decided like, you know, with Mike's experience. So I think what we're trying to do is like figure out what are the different solutions to solve these problems. And like when we did this thing in India and like actually delivering, like the guys that developed all the middleware, they're from South Africa, you know, the Prey Cult Foundation. And, you know, we couldn't do that. So we're just basically saying, well, you know, these are the things that I know about community development and, you know, delivering like on different technology platforms. It's like we just wanted to try to find different solutions for these, these issues out there. Anybody want to see my user flow? No? <laughs> phone somewhere, I think. <laughs> Anybody else? Huh? That was his sign. He's offering free beer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anything else? No? Okay, I think, I think that's it. If you want to ask any more questions, please feel free to come up later. <laughs>